Hey guys, how's it going? So today we're going to talk about one of my favorite service rifles. And this would be the Beretta BM-59. And this is one of my favorite rifles for several reasons. I'm going to go over a little bit of an overview of this gun. Just kind of a general review and basically hang out together and just talk about this gun a little bit. But before I do, I've mentioned before guys, YouTube doesn't monetize so much and I do have a Patreon account. And if you guys would like to help out the channel, the link is down in the description. And this video actually goes out to one of my Patreon supporters. He's a good friend of the channel, hell of a guy. So I hope you enjoy this Beretta man. Yes, his YouTube ID is Beretta man. So I thought it'd be fitting to show him a Beretta for him, especially for him, but also for the rest of you guys too. All right, so Beretta model 1959, or just simply Beretta 59. This is a 762 NATO chambered battle rifle, otherwise known as 762 by 51 or 308. This was originally adopted in Italy in 1959. But before we get into this gun too much, just by looking at it briefly, it's probably starting to look familiar. So I'm going to set this gun down for one second and show you another gun that you guys are familiar with that kind of got the Beretta BM-59 started. So this is an M1 Garand, otherwise known as U.S. Rifle Caliber 30 M1. This particular one is a Korean War era M1 Garand and this one has a Springfield Armory receiver and it has an IHC bolt. So like a lot of guns that you've seen, you know, this has had some refurbishment done, a little bit of mixed master parts, not a big deal. This is really, really common, but this is a pretty much an authentic, you know, example of what you would have seen our USGIs using. And not only World War II, but also into the Korean War. And a little piece of trivia for you guys. When I say IHC, that's the International Harvester Company. The same company that makes tractors and combines. Yep. They basically stopped making some of their farm implements and put their efforts towards the war effort. Like many American companies did. So parts of this gun were made by a tractor company. So as you guys probably already know, the U.S. Rifle M1 otherwise known as the Garand, was our one of our frontline rifles, right? Basically, our main service rifle and what was considered to be one of the pivotal weapons that were used in helping to win World War II. Probably one of the most famous rifles of the 20th century, right? That was used in United States service. Certainly a very historical gun, loved by many people, including me. Just an awesome rifle, right? Well, shortly after World War II, the United States it was over, the Allies won, and in typical United States fashion, our Ordnance Department said, hey, we have millions of these M1 Garands, we don't need all of them. So we sold some to Italy, to the Italians, shortly after World War II. Well, the Italians started using some of the rifles they got from us, as well as they started producing their own in the Beretta factory under license. So this was totally on the up and up, they were paying a royalty back to you know, Springfield Armory, Garand, the U.S. Ordnance Department, however it worked exactly. They were making them, you know, like I said, officially under license. So Italy was happy with the M1 Garand for a little over 10 years. I mean, at that point in time, what is there not to like about this rifle? I mean, semi-automatic, nice sighting system where you have an elevation adjustment, okay, as well as a windage knob, easily adjustable on the fly with no tools to get the gun sighted in. Semi-automatic, long stroke gas system with the famous operating rod that we're all familiar with, right? The only thing is though, is the M1 Garand was a little bit limited in the fact that it shot the 30-06 cartridge, otherwise known as the 762 by 63. 762 by 63, great cartridge. Many people still use 30-06 today. But there was a couple issues that were starting to limit this rifle. And that would mainly be capacity. 
Now instead of a detachable box magazine like a lot of modern rifles, the M1 Garand fed from an 8 round end block clip. And yes guys, this is a clip, not a magazine. And you could load 8 rounds through the top of the rifle. When it was done, it would eject the empty clip, the famous ping that the M1 Garands are known for, and it was time to reload again. Now, they had these handy bandoliers they would issue it with, and you could have them all strapped right on your chest, nice packaging, and you could load these pretty quick. So, by no means was this rifle outdated. So, like I said, Italy ended up purchasing some of these, started making them out of license, under license from the United States. All right, I'm going to do another video on the M1 Garand, guys, so that's enough of it for now. But we have to show the Garand before we can really talk about the BM-59. So World War II is over. We sell a bunch of Garands to Italy. Well, shortly thereafter, the United States entered the Korean War. And we had to start retooling up our factories and making Garands again. And that's when the Garand I just showed you would have been made during the Korean War era. Well, in the meantime, Italy was doing its own thing, and it really liked the Garand. And it was using it for well over a decade. Well, by the time 1950, late 50s rolled around, mid 50s, they said, well, the thing is, is the Garand's awesome. It's venerable. It's tried and true. Look what the United States did with it. The, the Italians thought it was an effective weapon, but they were ready to modernize, right? Bring it up into the next, you know, the new age, if you will, at that time. So... The BM-59 was born. Basically, if you look at this rifle, you're going to start noticing right away, it looks a lot like an M1 Garand. If you look at the stock, the overall shape and comb of the stock, if you look at the receiver itself, let's look at this sighting system. Same thing, guys. Windage. I'm sorry, we're going to show you elevation first. See how as I twist this knob, the rear peep sight keeps coming up and up. At this point, when it's in its highest position, you're literally aiming the rifle almost at the ceiling so sighted out to an extremely long range obviously we can crank this back down to a battle zero it also has the same windage adjustment whereas you turn this knob it's just going to simply drift i'm sorry guys this is a long gun but you're basically just turning this right hand knob and you're moving the rear peep sight side to side so completely windage adjustable we're going to notice again it has a long stroke gas system with the famous operating rod yet again. We're going to look closely at the receiver, the shape of it, everything. It's looking a lot like a Garand, isn't it? That's because it kind of sort of is. So, like I said, they had the um, they had the M1 Garands, Beretta did. They created a new rifle out of the receivers and a lot of the same actual parts as the M1 Garands that were both sold from the United States and the ones that they made themselves. So essentially what we have here is a modified M1 Garand receiver, okay? And I'll explain in a second what some of the modifications were. Because this gun is no longer chambered in the 30-06, otherwise known as 762 by 63 When the Beretta 59 was developed, they rechambered it into the modern 762 NATO, or 308. Reasons being, well, they realized that we weren't really going to be fighting on the battlefield in the traditional sense that had carried over, believe it or not, from the 1800s, where people would be, you know, lining up in rank and file, fighting from trenches, shooting out to like 2,000 yards. That used to be the manual of arms, and that used to be, at that point in time, an accurate, you know, measure of war. That's how they used to treat ground troops, like these long, long battles where you'd be moving from trenches to trenches. And you guys know the history of the World War I into World War II. Well, after World War II was over, they said enough of that. In World War II, we really didn't have these 2,000 yard engagements on a regular basis. So although the 30-06 has a little more legs to it, right? A little more power, it'll go a further distance and still have terminal effect. They said 308's plenty. Now, by going down to the 308, if you will, they were able to carry more ammunition, less weight, and they decided it was more strategic to have a loadout of more rounds of 308 rather than less rounds of 30 out 6, which I think makes sense. And in hindsight, probably a good idea. And they realized, well, you know, even though these end block clips, they're a nice clip system and they're auto ejecting and the bandoliers, it's all good. It's time to move to the detachable box magazine so they basically took an m1 garand 
rechambered it to a 308 barrel, cut the barrel down to about 19.3 inches. So now we've got a little bit handier rifle. I mean, it's still a full size battle rifle, but it's a little shorter, right? Which is nice. And I'll show you why the barrel needed to be shorter in a minute because of the stuff on the front that they did that was a little bit different. But let's go back to the receiver. Like I said before, what's the same? Well, the actual receiver itself is basically an M1 Garand receiver, whether it was an Italian made under contract, under license, or a US. Same operating rod, same actual bolt. And this is interesting. Let's see it. Sometimes it has a hard time picking up on the black colors here, but we see right here, HRA. Well, that sounds familiar for you M1 Garand collectors, right? HRA, like I said before, Springfield, Winchester, some of the big arms companies, but you also had tractor companies. And then you had some other companies that weren't necessarily United States arsenals, but they were arms manufacturers. Well, in this case, HRA is Harrington and Richardson, which is a United States based arms manufacturer. And they were contracted to help chip in for the war. So this has an original World War II era bolt marked HRA. The Italians didn't scrub any of the US rifle markings off of these. So we do have actual components of an M1 Garand in this BM-59, which I think is pretty cool. So we're still using the bolts are the same. We're still using the same sighting system. Great sight, by the way. Peep sight. What more could you ask for? Especially in 1959. So whenever we're looking at this gun, just think about it, how state-of-the-art this gun was and how many features it actually had in 1959. Considering the United States was just starting to transition from the M1 Garand to the M14. So Italy was right on top of this, right? Well, we've also modified the bottom of the receiver. So back to the Garand real quick. There's simply a floor plate because there's no magazine in these, right? They feed from end block clips through the top, eject out of the top, load through the top. There's nothing going on down here with loading mags, right? So you can clearly see on this M1 Garand receiver, some modifications had to be made, material removed, a latch put in place. Now we can still see, let me remove this magazine. This is an official PB, which I might be mispronouncing this, but Pietro Beretta, I'm not Italian guys, sorry. Model BM59 mag, and you can see the PB right there. You're gonna see the PB marking on many, many parts on this gun, by the way. So no more end block clip. Now that we've moved up to the BM59, we're feeding from 20 round detachable box magazine, which is real similar to how our modern weapons shoot from, right? You don't think AR-15, AK, any of them, right? So we've definitely moved up a big step here. 20 rounds on tap, one insertion of a mag is gonna replace two and a half of these. We can still see remnants on the bottom of the old Garand receiver where you can see where this was just literally the sheet metal area of what used to be the old floor plate there on the Garand has been cut out. The stock in the front has been relieved of some of the wood to allow this mag to go in. We have a mag catch slash release right here. Not too much different than an AK to be honest. You know, you push forward on it, it releases the mag. These mags do not completely insert straight in like an AR-15. They're a little bit of a rock and lock. Let me show you guys a little better on camera here. So I'm gonna basically take my thumb, push it on this lever, grab the mag, rock it slightly forward, and pull it out so it's not to the extent of like an AK where you have to rock it way in but there is still a little bit of a rock and lock motion where you come in on the front on a little bit of an angle come to the back and you hear it click in place so not bad at all everything's like a hundred times harder to do on camera guys but in real life when you're out there shooting real easy to do mag changes on this gun so 20 round box mag. Now, as far as the trigger goes, not really any different than a Garand. So I'm gonna charge the weapon to make the trigger hot. We're gonna notice here, there's a little tab that sticks forward of the trigger guard, okay? And to put this gun on safe, again, same as the Garand, we're just gonna take this here, 
See if I can show that to you. And we're going to push back. You hear a positive click. Now there's the safety sticking into the trigger guard. So basically, if it was dark, mittens, gloves, etc., the soldier could easily tell whether the gun was unsafe because he'd stick his finger in here. If he can't feel his finger going up against the trigger guard, he knows the safety's on, right? So if we pull the trigger, nothing happens. Now, the way this was supposed to be used is you could come in if you wanted to with like your thumb and just push forward. You know, that physically works, right? But the way this was designed to be used is you stick your finger in there like you're getting ready to fire around, push forward with your finger. Now we've disengaged the safety. It's left the trigger guard. Now the trigger is able to be pulled. As far as trigger pull goes, let's do that again. Now, this isn't what we would call a match grade or sporting grade trigger, but for a military surplus, the trigger's actually not bad on this. We're going to have just, you know, it feels nice and firm right off the bat. I'm going to squeeze a teeny bit of take up. See that? Predictable take up. I'm hitting a firm wall right here. Not bad. Not bad considering what this gun is, a 1950s, you know, era designed battle rifle. You know, you don't want a military rifle that has a three, three and a half pound trigger. That's actually not a good thing because when troops are patrolling and their fingers at the ready and they're not quite sure their target yet, you don't want somebody to get slightly spooked, breathe on the trigger and have it go off. So as with most military arms, you're not going to find a hair trigger on these and for good reason, especially considering the fact that. Now this is a legal United States version, a Title I firearm. It's been neutered, unfortunately. These were originally also converted into machine guns. So look at these as, like I said, a fully automatic machine gun in their service use. Now this particular example we're showing today is not a machine gun, just operates in semi-automatic only, but that is what the gun was originally designed for as implemented in Italian military service. Just taking a look down here. There's another really cool feature that this gun has. And I would note all over the place. I don't know if the camera is going to pick this up. But we're going to see little PBs. Little proof marks that say PB. Pretty much everywhere. Beretta always like to label all their parts with their name on it. So if you guys are wondering what this little lever is. Check this out. So imagine you're out there fighting in the winter time. You're wearing mittens. Mittens as you guys know are actually quite a bit warmer than gloves. Or even just a thick pair of winter gloves, right? It's cold outside. You can't get your finger in the trigger, right? So this has what's referred to as a winter trigger. So this little lever here, we're just going to literally move it down. You'll notice it kind of, you know, clicks in place. Now, we're going to completely bypass this main trigger. Although we could still use it, we're just going to be using this. This actually becomes our trigger. So pretend these are mittens here. No movement of my fingers, right? Thick mittens, wool mittens. You can just take your paw, come up to this winter trigger, pull to the rear, and the rifle fires. Now, when you're doing it that way, it's a very, very light trigger pull because we now have another inch, right, of leverage, of fulcrum. So just regular old leverage, guys. The trigger becomes very light. And then if you want to take your gloves off or you're fighting in a battle where you're not in the cold, it just folds right out of the way. You don't really notice it's there. You don't ever have to use it, but this is an awesome little feature, isn't it? If you're wearing mittens, gloves, or let's just say even hypothetically, you know, trigger fingers badly wounded, so is your middle finger. You could sit there with this gun and fire it from the, you know, heel of your hand. You could come up and fire this gun even like this if you had to. I mean, just think about it, like improvising on the battlefield. Your fingers are injured for whatever reason. You could come underneath this gun literally as I just did with your wrist. And fire a shot so I think this is an awesome feature you don't see on many guns but I would argue would probably still have its uses today on many modern service rifles let me know what you guys think about this winter trigger guard pretty freaking cool and there's not much to hate about it because if you don't want to use it you just leave it up there and forget it's there right so as I said earlier this basically has a modified meaning up front modified and cut down M1 Garand stock. A lot of these were made in Italy over the years, but the original stocks were actually just truly modified 
M1 Garand stocks. And we'll take another look at the Garand here. See if you guys can notice how similar indeed these stocks are. Same type of comb, same type of semi pistol grip there. The operating rods. All the way till we start getting up to the barrel bands. That's when things change. So, modified Garand stocks you'll find on some of these. And of course, this rifle was developed in 1959 and actually served in main service, you know, in Italy until 1990. Now, up until very recent times, if not in still small amounts today, the Italian Navy is still using these. So, but as a frontline main service rifle, this gun served for 31 years. So, a lot of these have had the stocks replaced over the years, etc. But they still retain, in many cases, original USGI parts, as well as original PB marked PHO Beretta parts. So, we're kind of half Garand, but we're kind of half M14 at this point, too. Now, here's where I think this gun is actually a little better than the M14. We've already got the features of the winter trigger, right? And now the front of the gun is where we really get some other nice features. So you're gonna notice right away, this gun has the M1 Garand sling swivel here, same one. When we get up front, let me turn it around, we're gonna notice they've now moved the sling swivel to the side where it's on the bottom with the Garand. Well, they had to move the sling swivel to the side because one of the big features for this gun is it now includes an integrally attached bipod. So there we go. Now this gun can be used at rest for sniping or DMR type rolls. Now the 308 being a smaller round than the 30 at 6 still not a weak round guys. The, the 308 is still effective at hundreds and hundreds of yards in the battlefield. So this provided the shooter a nice steady mounting point to where he could literally shoot this thing from a bench rest type of situation with the bipod, which is an excellent, excellent feature. So there's nothing here that you clip on or anything. I mean, you can detach it if you undo the hardware, but this bipod is mainly designed for the main BM-59s. There were different versions of these, but the main model, which I'm showing here, came with the integrally attached bipod. So I think that's pretty cool. Another thing too we're gonna notice is on the front of this gun. Now, the gun only has a 19.3 inch barrel, but overall, from the end of the demuzzle device back, it's about the same length as the Garand. Now, there's a couple reasons for this. They wanted to shorten up the rifle so they could put some of this cool stuff on the front. Also, the 308, in general, I'm not trying to go down a ballistics rabbit hole, doesn't need quite as long of a barrel as the 30-06. And also, remember back to what I said earlier, they've now decided it's more important to have higher rates of fire, suppressive fire, fire superiority. That's kind of a little better now than trying to take these aimed shots at 2,000 yards from trench to trench. So they pulled the barrel down to get it a little more compact. And then they added a combination muzzle device. And what this does is actually three different things in one. So we're going to notice there's a bunch of little small ports here that are drilled throughout the outside of this muzzle device. So this gives it muzzle brake characteristics. So this is a muzzle brake. And then you're gonna notice the little prongs or slots near the end, right? That are gonna remind you kind of sort of of like a USGI birdcage that would be on your M14, your M16s. So this is a flash hider. So this is a combination muzzle brake slash flash hider. And we're gonna now notice some rings here. And those of you used to mill serps are probably already guessing what this is for. This also served as the spigot in other words, attachment device for launchers where this could fire, you know, rifle grenades. No grenades here, YouTube. This is just what this was originally designed for. So we have a three-way, a launching spigot, a muzzle brake, and a flash hider. Now that adds a few inches, but we chopped the barrel down a few inches to compensate where we're still at the same overall length as an M1 Garand. By chopping the barrel down a little bit too, it allowed the Italians to add this hard rubber. Now this isn't a plastic, it's a rubber. It doesn't feel real soft, but under recoil, it actually does add a little cushion to the shoulder. Certainly more comfortable than the just solid steel butt plate with the trap door that the M1 Garand's used, okay? And it says right here on the back, let's see if we can get the camera to pick up something on this rifle for you guys. 
there we go P. Barata, Italy so this is the original Italian made you know rubbery hard rubber buttstock pads so we've added some comfort this also helps for a lot of shooters that are a little bit taller gives them a little bit increased length of pull which I think is actually a good thing the length of pull on the Garand is great and all but it seems like this extra you know three quarters of an inch to an inch that this adds at least for me anyways puts this rifle a lot closer to where I would like it to be as far as a comfortable length of pull so trying to knock the camera down guys there we go no problem you know this Barada did service originally as a USGI rifle later later went on to serve the country of Italy and now it's doing its best to destroy this camera so don't ever underestimate this old girl okay so I said before that it has a spigot right well before you launch a rifle grenade as you guys know from other guns like AKs etc we need grenade sights so right here is our grenade sight we flip it up now we are going to be able to simply use the three different ladders there's three different main yardages here 50 yards 75 and 100 each of those teeth are marked appropriately it's hard to get it in the camera but basically the first slot here is 50 yards 75 and 100 and with the trajectory of a grenade obviously if you're going to shoot at 100 yards for me to look through the rear peep sight i'm literally aiming the rifle about like this which makes sense that is an appropriate trajectory for launching a rifle grenade it's not going to go as far as a bullet projectile but you need to get it high in the air to loft it in right maybe over a hill bunker over a vehicle that the enemy might be hiding behind so yeah pretty common for grenade launching we have a protected front sight with two ears on it this is basically an m1 garand sight we also have now a bayonet lug there's a special bm59 bayonet i'm sorry guys i do not have one if i end up getting one at a later date I'll do a quick update if anyone's interested in the bayonet but as of right now I don't have it we're gonna have a gas plug here at the end very similar to an M1 Garand now I would note this particular rifle does have some of the later features like the later M1 Garand sights if you guys are into Garands you'll know what I mean some of the original ones had the locking bar but we'll go over Garands more in another video and I'll show you a World War II that has more of the earlier feature you know for the grand and then we'll talk more about this korean war era that's sitting right here but mainly i want to talk about the bm59 today but i think you guys have already seen enough it's hard not to show the grand a few times because this is basically the grand in my opinion being upgraded to about as modern as it could be so basically a recap m1 grand sold to and made under license by italy Shortly after World War II, they decided to go to this BM-59. It was used from 1959 to 1990, so 31 years of frontline service. Still a handful of these probably being used in the Italian Navy today. The Grand Receiver has been modified to take a 20-round detachable box magazine. Still some original USGI present parts in this gun. A lot of history there. Really cool. One more thing I would note with this bolt. The follower of the magazine does hold it open on the last round and to close the bolt there is a release right here so I'm gonna press that release hit my thumb with the charging handle because it's hard to film such a big gun in front of the camera but the moral of the story is this bolt release is right here I forgot to show you guys earlier that even has the Beretta marking on it right there as well the PB PB BM 59 You'll see that same marking in like 20 places on this gun, by the way, guys. As well as Harrington and Richardson markings, USGI markings. I mean, this thing's pretty neat. So, same long stroke gas system as the Garand. Barrel's a little shorter now. 19.3 inches, chambered in the 7.62 NATO, a.k.a. 308. Side mount sling swivel integral bipod that comes down very nice bipod by the way i would note little sharp pointed prongs on the bottom that allow you to dig into a semi-hard surface such as a fallen tree tree stump hard packed earth so very very strong bipod 
A three-way muzzle device that acts as a launching spigot, a muzzle brake, and a flash hider with the appropriate launcher ladder sights. These are available in parts kit form. There are sites out there that sell what they call modified M1 Garand receivers. For someone that has some good, you know, skills and knows what they're doing, you need the right gauges. I'm not advocating for you guys to do this, but for those of you that know more about putting guns together than me, it is possible for someone to build one of these from a kit with a modified receiver. Some of these were imported in the early 80s in the United States as complete guns. There's been other offerings as of recently that were made with new USA made receivers, new USA made barrels, and original Barata kits, which consist of many Barata parts and a few USGI parts. So there's multiple ways to get one of these guns. One of the main features I really like about this is this winter trigger. Totally awesome, especially thinking about how cold it gets here in Michigan and how cold it is in much of the world. I can definitely see people with their thick mittens utilizing this trigger the gun's a little heavy you know good thing i'm fairly strong because it's getting my arms a little bit tired holding it up here for a half hour but hey it's the least i can do for you guys but the gun weighs in at around 9.7 pounds unloaded so we're talking almost 10 pounds but remember that's near the weight of the garand and this was 1959 so in my opinion okay due to several of the key features of this gun I think Beretta kindly probably refined the M1 Garand about as modern and useful for military service as it could be. And it's kind of cool that they were able to carry on the, you know, Garand tradition, if you will, all the way till 1990. Um, gonna do more videos in the near future on the US M1 rifle, which is the Garand that I just showed you some m1 carbines and i'm going to do a video on the m14 because when i say this is what the m1 garand kind of wish or the m1 m14 wishes it was i'm not joking but i'm not disrespecting the m14 either also a great rifle so we'll show that in another video as well just taking a quick peek at the gun here to see if there's anything you know useful that i might have missed but just kind of talking about this gun with you guys and just giving you a general overview of it Smooth shooting rifle with the 308, by the way. Plenty of weight in this gun. Nice American walnut stock. I believe by looking at this stock, this is probably an original USGI that has been sanded a little bit and cleaned up. But this really reminds me of the old American walnut that you find on the M1 Garands, the 1903s, the 1917s, the M1 carbines. You know, the classic old school walnut. So... There's different variations of the stocks on these that Italy used, including polymer stocks. But this is my favorite variant because it just has so much of these modern features that in some cases you don't even see on new rifles, like this trigger. A pretty advanced, actually, and very, very effective muzzle device, which, like I was alluding to earlier, makes this gun very smooth shooting. Lots of weight in this gun, a very effective muzzle device. The 308 having a little bit less kick to it than the 30 6 this is just a gun you can shoot for hours, and when you get bored of shooting it offhand, you can just plop right down on the ground or the bench and literally just go at it all day or until you're broke, which for me, I'd go broke first because 308's not cheap and can be pretty fun to shoot. You guys know exactly how that works. So yeah, Beretta model BM-59. More U.S. service rifles coming soon for you Taurus guys out there. I have a couple unboxings of brand new Taurus products that are going to be coming up very soon in the next couple days. And for you AK guys, I've been getting some of the Hungarian variants staged and there'll be some Hungarian AK videos soon and some Chinese also. So trying to keep all the um, mill syrup stuff going here. I only have one problem guys. I have so many interests. I work like 80 hours a week in my real life job because this isn't a job. This is just having fun. and. I have like 30 gun videos I want to do right now. And there's only seven days in the week. So there's a list. Any of you Patreon supporters out there want to see a certain rifle, let me know down in the comments. Send me a message on Patreon, however you want to get a hold of me. I'd like to oblige because I do appreciate you guys a lot. And for the rest of you, I appreciate you guys watching, liking, and sharing the channel. So I also thank you guys and 
like I said, it just feels like I'm hanging out with my friends when I do these videos, which is pretty cool. So I hope you guys appreciate these videos as much as I appreciate you guys. All right, Beretta model BM59 for a Beretta man. And I don't know how much you knew about this rifle, but maybe I taught you something. If not, maybe we just had fun hanging out. All right, guys. Thanks for watching and have a good one.